Um, this next fellow is Poet Laureate of Orange County. He is our Johnny Appleseed, one of the most dedicated individuals to the proliferation of not only literacy, but poetry. 28 events? I have hosted 28 events. Let me show off. 28 events through all these decades is extraordinary. With great pleasure, Robert Milby. Thank you, Hayden. Thank you, everyone else. I want to first mention a few upcoming events uh, in the weeks to come, just a few, but also to uh, let you know that today is the one year anniversary of this series. So, congratulations. Also, it's been a long time since I heard Jim Eve. Good to hear you, Jim. Thank you. You're welcome. This one, but I'm going to do some poets' birthdays and death days because that's what I, I like to do. So for all you Capricorns out there, right? All right. From the past week, going back to the eighth, friend of Charles Dickens, Wilkie Collins, great novelist, born in England on the eighth of um, January in 1824. American poet John Nyhart, also a novelist, born on the 8th, yes, in 1881. Black Some, There you go, Black Alex Speaks, exactly, great book. Uh, some of you remember uh, some of the 60s rock music. This is Robbie Krieger of The Doors, great guitarist, born in 1946 on the 8th, okay. British poet Charles Tomlinson, born in England, 1927 and the death of Paul Verlaine at age 52, wow. who was crowned Prince of Poets uh, in 1894. He was that well known. He died in 1896. On the 9th, William Meredith, another American poet, 1919. Joan Baez, born in 1941. The anniversary of the death of um, an, a major American poet, Amiri Baraka, died at age 79. He, was, he almost made 80. He was uh, 79, died uh, in 2014 on the 9th of January. And if you like music, Scott Walker of the famous Walker Brothers, born in 1943. On the 10th, we have the great Robinson Jeffers, born near Pittsburgh, 1887. Philip Levine, the famous one, born in 1928. He was once poet laureate of the United States. Hudson Valley poet, man who needs no microphone, David Kimes' birthday. Former Hudson Valley poet, some of you remember Skip Leon. Skip's birthday. Skip is almost 60 years old now. Hard to believe. Former Hudson Valley poet Ken Pearson. He may still be in the Hudson Valley. His birthday. Anniversary of the death of David Bowie at age 69 on the 10th last year, 2016. And the great jazz drummer Max Roach. Some of you who love jazz, I do. Max Roach's birthday, 1924. On the 11th, which is... Yesterday, we have Vasily Kalinikov, Russian poet, died 1901. Now get this, also the 11th of January is the anniversary of the birth, check this out, Jim and Ted, of Mauro Parisi, Mauro's birthday. Yeah. Yep, Mauro would be uh, 59, looks like. And on the 12th, which is today, Hudson Valley poet Rebecca Shumeda, and I'm not telling you how old she turned today. Also, the great Jack London. Some of you remember Jack London. Born... Is that true? What? Shumaker? She made his birthday today, yeah. Yeah, how old? What? How old? All right, she's 40. <laughs> All right. I knew somebody was going to ask. Be Becky is 40 today. All right. She's living up in Albany now with her husband and children, but she's 40 today. And like I said, Jack London, the great Jack London, born in 1876. I should have mentioned this earlier, I think it was the fourth, I'd have to double check, but Lou O'Neill just turned, I think, 86, so 80, 86, Lou O'Neill. Yep, all right, that's enough of all that. All the birthdays and wonderful stuff. Okay, good night, Roz. Bless you, thank you. Take care. I hope so. All right, let me read something by Robinson Jeffers. 
And then I want to read one by a poet a lot of people have forgotten. I'll tell you about him in a moment. Let's see, where did it go? So I was saying uh, Robinson Jeffers was born on the 10th of January in 1887. His father was a Protestant minister. And so when the boy was growing up, he got a lot of uh, political and religious training, you know, very interesting stuff. He was worried a lot about Hitler in World War II, as were many Americans, even before Hitler was a threat. So this was written in April 1938. Contemplation of the sword. Reason will not decide at last. The sword will decide. The sword, an obsolete instrument of bronze or steel, formerly used to kill men, but here in the sense of a symbol, the sword, that is the storms and counterstorms of a general destruction, killing of men, destruction of all goods and materials, massacre, more or less intentional, of children and women, destruction poured down from wings, the air made accomplice, the innocent air perverted into assassin and poisoner. The sword that is treachery and cowardice, incredible baseness, incredible courage, loyalties, insanities. The sword weeping in despair, mass enslavement, mass torture, frustration of all the hopes that starred man's forehead. Tyranny for freedom, horror for happiness, famine for bread, carrion for children. Reason will not decide at last, the sword will decide. Dear God, who are the whole splendor of things and the sacred stars, but also the cruelty and greed, the treacheries and vileness, insanities and filth and anguish now, that this thing comes near us again. I am finding it hard to praise you with a whole heart. I know what pain is, but pain can shine. I know what death is, I have sometimes longed for it. But cruelty and slavery and degradation, pestilence, filth, the pitifulness of men, like little hurt birds and animals, if you were only waves beating rock, the wind and the iron cord earth, the flaming insolent wildness of sun and stars, with what a heart I could praise your beauty. You will not repent, nor cancel life, nor free man from anguish for many years to come. You are the one that tortures himself to discover himself. I am the one that watches you and discovers you and praises you in little parables, idol or tragedy, beautiful, intolerable God, the sword. That is, I have two sons whom I love. They are twins. They were born in 1916, which seemed to us a dark year of a great war. They are now of the age that war prefers. The firstborn is like his mother. He is so beautiful that persons I hardly know have stopped me on the street to speak of the grave beauty of the boy's face. The secondborn has strength for his beauty. When he strips for swimming, the hero shoulders and wrestler loins make him seem clothed. The sword that is loathsome disfigurements, blindness, mutilation, locked lips of boys, too proud to scream. Reason will not decide in the end. The sword will decide. Robinson Jeffers. And if you haven't read his work, I recommend you do. Back in his day, during the 1940s, he was probably among the few American poets who was followed around by the FBI, literally, in the 50s, too. Yeah. All right, I didn't mention the American poet from Arkansas, John Gould Fletcher. I don't know, have you heard of him? Clayton or no? John Gould Fletcher? Okay, he's forgotten, unfortunately. A lot of people don't remember. But he was born on the 3rd of January in 1886, in Little Rock, so I want to read uh, one of his shorter poems, and I'll read a few of mine. I think this one is beautiful, and after what I just read, okay. London Nightfall, he spent time in England. I saw the shapes that stood upon the clouds, and they were tiger-breasted, shot with light, and all of them lifting long trumpets together, blew over the city for the night to come. Down in the street we floundered in the mud, Above in endless files, gold angels came and stood upon those clouds and blew their horns for night. 
Like a wet petal crumpled, twilight fell soddenly on the weary city. The buses lurched and groaned, the shops put up their doors. But skywards, far aloft, the angels vanishing, waved broad plumes of gold, summoning spirits from a, th a thousand hills to pour the thick night out upon the earth. John Gould Fletcher. All right, some of these forgotten American poets. And I'll do just a few of mine, so you can run now. All right. Get ready, like I said, winter is coming back. I'm not saying I'm welcoming it back, but the wood stove. Early winter morning, the wolf is gone. The wind remains in sunrise, complaint with bare trees. Wood stove is speaking hot words of combustion, and great heat seeps out from its iron maw. I feed the gray monster seasoned oak, swamp maple with woodpecker art, and elm waiting for the rage of fire. This cauldron is decisive. Either maintain the insatiable appetite or suffer the inevitable flickering cinder, an aperture of smoldering ashes from the tiny window on its squeaking door. North wind complains at locked doors and windows glazed in ice. Father taught of primal visions evoked from fireplace wood stove. The cauldron sings through centuries of frost and snow, walking through groves and roadside refugees forlorn and soul song released in crackling exhalation of roaring memory. I singe scattered thoughts and recall people long gone. I feed an iron oven the ire of my past, declarations, demands, prayers. Wind-dried leaves stammer through smoke. Birds crowd brick pews atop the chimney. Their huddle cured in winter's incense, starlings sunrise rooftop mass. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Let's see. Um, some of you may know that you may remember that a beer, beer, B-I-E-R, is a wooden frame that either a casket or a corpse is laid upon before uh, being either incinerated or buried in the ground. And uh, the active ingredient in alcohol is ethanol. And of course, coffee, caffeine, is an alkaloid. So sooner or later, people are going to catch on that I don't consume alcohol. Not ethanol, but alkaloid. Don't offer me a beer. Beer is not something I want to put myself into. Don't offer me ale. I don't want to ale after imbibing. I do not wine, no vino, no foot juice, no fermented gems of the vine. No brandy, I won't be marked. No whiskey, wherein the conscience becomes contumacious in spirit and in flesh, for I have enough ghosts following me. Distillery of wheat mash, hops, why chase the dragon when you can become one? Madness of ergot rye, or drinking rotten potato water, not ethanol, but alkaloid. Coffee at dawn, coffee in an attic garret, coffee in a basement hovel, coffee in a humid jungle, coffee in a snowstorm. If coffee could move cars, would companies thin petrol with it? Coffee clysters can heal. Ethanol enemas are enemy. But does that stop the quest to have demons possess the body? Coffee for the mad. No alcohol allowed in the asylum, but coffee is permitted in group therapy for drunks. Not ethanol, but alkaloid. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I'll be shot sooner or later. <laughs> you know, it was okay for Gandhi to say, I have a horror of alcohol. All right, let me do one more. Let's see. This is, um, this is also why the academics, you can leave now, hate my guts, and I have a long list of the quackademics, not the two of you, who hate me. And uh, that's just the way it is. Epic on a matchbox. Strike. The coarse, stark poem. Kick it, slap it, punch it, 
lick its skin, and drag your ragged nails across its blackboard visage. Ablaze, away from the melted malaise of clean-cut academics' limp, wet branches, and paycheck high holy days, a glaze over their coiffed lecterns, laptops, and Pulitzer glances. Yours is plastic gasoline, a fire folly with fear perfume of kerosene, a light, a fright, a fire late in the night, no wine to wind the brain clock gears back into scholarly obeisance. Your poem has bonfires as its cult following. Watchfires atop the snow crags and ice caves where Roman heads rest on lances while below, in the sad wreck of their gray city, adjunct drunks weep in their sleep dreaming of your tribal dances. Thank you.